today. Let's get into the Word of God. As I prayed about the message for today, I thought originally we might explore a passage from Jeremiah. How many are still in your, in your one house reading? Stay with me. We're going to finish this strong. Well, as I got into Jeremiah, nothing really, really spoke to me there. So I thought, well, let's go into Psalms. I love the Psalms. And Psalm 78 was so long, I thought, oh, we'll, we'll go into Psalm 78. Not so. Maybe one of the Proverbs. I know our Proverbs are like one or two, maybe three or four per day. Maybe we'll, we'll go into the Proverbs. No. We closed out Colossians. And as I read Paul's final words, his final greetings to the church in Colossae, the Holy Spirit nudged me and prompted me to preach from Paul's final greetings to the Colossians. If you have your Bible, why don't you go with me now to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. And we'll start with verse number 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. This is Paul writing to the church in Colossae. Tychicus is a beloved brother and a faithful minister. He's a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, I'm sending Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends greetings to you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning you have received instructions if he comes to you, treat him well. Take good care of him. Welcome him. And Jesus, who we also call justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a great comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, he greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and full, fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Aeropolis. Luke, my beloved physician, also greets you, as does Demas. Give my greeting to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. A woman pastor. Wow. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter that I wrote to Laodicea. Don't miss that. And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember that I am in chains. Grace be with you. And Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to speak to us today by the power of your word that is a living word. Change our lives and change our hearts and change our minds and Help us to stay on fire. Help us to stay ablaze for you. And do not let the fire down, die down in our hearts and in our lives. Keep us passionate for you. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So here Paul ends his letter to the Colossians with greetings from people that are important to Paul. People that matter to the Apostle Paul. Starts with Tychicus. And don't judge me if I mispronounce these names. They're not no ordinary names for us today. I think it's Tychicus. Tychicus is one of Paul's personal representatives. He is a frequent 
companion of Paul. He would travel with him. He actually was one that accompanied Paul um, when he brought the offering, the collection to Jerusalem. Tychicus was with Paul and they delivered. He probably is the one who delivered this particular letter to the Colossians. Onesimus is mentioned. Does anybody remember who Onesimus was? Anyone, Tim? Yes, he's Philemon's slave and a lover of Christ. Onis, Onesimus, one of Philemon's slaves, he was a faithful Christian, a faithful believer in Christ. Aristarchus. Aristarchus was a Jew from Thessalonica. Remember Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. That was a letter to the people who lived in Thessalonica. And he also was a traveling companion of Paul's. Mark, anybody know who Mark is? Mark wrote the gospel of Mark. And he, it says here he was a cousin to Barnabas. Um, it also could be that he was a nephew. Anyway, they're related. We know that much. Could be a cousin, could be a nephew, but it is that particular Mark. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the one he's mentioning here. Um, Jesus, who they also call Justice. So there's a fellow worker named Justice. He was a fellow worker for the kingdom, and he comforted Paul. Paul really loved this particular person. Epaphras is mentioned. He founded the Colossian church. He was the founder of the Colossian church and probably kept the church together through difficult times. Um, Luke is mentioned here. Matthew, Mark, Luke. It is that Luke. He is a physician and he not only wrote the gospel of Luke, he also wrote what? The book of Acts. And so he's part of this as well. And he mentions Luke. Demas is mentioned here. Um, so Demas... Demas was faithful to Paul for a while, but Paul actually exposes him later and says, that dirty Demas deserted me. <laughs> and so I, we don't have all the details, but it is probably the same Demas that he writes about in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10. Demas deserted me, he said. So it happens, doesn't it? I mean, come on, it happens. Nympha, I love that he mentions a woman here. Nympha was probably a woman pastor of a local church there, a smaller community, and she opened up her home and she was pastoring a group of people. Um, Archippus. Archippus is probably the current pastor or perhaps a deacon, but definitely one of the leaders in the current church of uh, Colossae when Paul writes this and his words to Archippus are actually uh, stern. You may not read it that way, but as I have done research on this, these are actually stern words in chapter 17, uh, verse number 17, and say to Archippus, make sure to tell the current pastor, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. This is actually a little bit stern from Paul. So these people think about this. They didn't know that Paul was going to be mentioning them. Some may have said, hey, I understand you're writing a letter to the Colossians. Make sure and tell them I said, hey. Right? We do that, right? Hey, I, every Friday I talk to my dad and I, I tell Paula, my stepmom, tell Paula that I love her. Tell her I said hi. I'm not, not talking to her. You know, if you see Tammy or Donnan or Beth, my sisters, tell them I love them. Tell them I said. So we do that. So maybe, maybe some. But I think there are, are, are a few in this final greetings from Paul. They didn't even know they were going to be mentioned. They're just being faithful. Faithful servants of the Lord. And Paul notices. And Paul just jots some things down. Man, this brother brings me so much comfort. Pretty cool when you think about it. These people probably didn't even know that Paul was mentioning them. And even if they did, they certainly would not have expected their names and their deeds to go down throughout history and be preserved throughout history. 
And yet, that is exactly what happened. Pastors, deacons, fellow workers, kingdom builders, and simple servants of the Lord, their names and their deeds preserved for all time to encourage others throughout history who would read this great book. And here it is encouraging us today as fresh as if he wrote it yesterday and it just arrived on our doorstep. I wonder if Paul were to write a letter to a distant church from La Palma, who in this room, who viewing live stream would make the cut? Who would be mentioned in his final greetings for their deeds and for their love and for their comfort and for their kindness and for their serving? Wow. However, this is not what spoke to me as I read the end of Colossians. What really stood out to me was the mention of a certain city. Look at this. Go back to verse 13 of chapter 4. For I bear witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea. What do you think about when I say the word Laodicea, church? Anyone? Jenny. Okay, what about it though? They were the, one of the seven churches in Revelation the only church of the seven churches that didn't get commendation from Jesus. They only were rebuked. He said nothing good about what they were doing, Laodicea. Paul mentions it, this city again in verse number 15. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. You see it again in verse number 16. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And also make sure that you read the letter that I wrote to the Laodiceans. That's interesting. Notice that Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans that did not survive. Now remember, the apostles wrote many letters, and sadly, some were not preserved, some were not canonized. And here's one that was lost. We do not have the letter to the Laodiceans. Wouldn't you like to read that, though? Pretty fascinating. So today we're going to learn lessons from Laodicea. Do me a favor and jot down some notes today. This church that has a reputation at the end of it all of being lukewarm is going to teach us today. There are lessons for La Palma from Laodicea. Starting with this lesson. Let's start by looking at the founding of Laodicea. Now here's a little of what we know about this city the founding of the city. Laodicea was founded around 250 B.C. before Christ came. So it's about 250 years old. It was founded by Antichus II. And this leader named the city after his wife, Laodice. Interesting trivia right there. The city was strategically located in the Lycus Valley, which is current Turkey. All the seven churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, they all are in what we know as Turkey. So it's, it, was, it was strategically located in this Lycus Valley is what it was called. It was called that because that's where the Lycus River flowed through. And wherever there is water, there's going to be life. And they are going to build a city where there's water. And this is a nice sized river. And so they build this city here. All roads, all roads from major uh, 
areas and major cities like Ephesus, it would come through this valley and, and into this town. And so it was, a, it was a strategically located city, and it was a hub for commerce and trade, and it actually became a very wealthy city. It was a very wealthy city at the time of Paul's writing this letter. And it's very close to uh, Colossae. They are about 11 miles apart. And so Aeropolis is also mentioned. So these three cities, they're right in the same area. If you've got a map in your Bible, you can look that up and see that perhaps. So that's the founding of the city. What about the founding of the church? Here's what we know. The church of Laodicea was founded by Epaphras, one of the ones that was mentioned in his final greetings. Epaphras founded this church probably around 55 AD. And this would have been about the time that Paul and his companions, they are evangelizing regions that don't have churches and they are trying to establish churches in areas that don't know about Christ. And so Ephesus and Colossae are founded around this same time. And so... That's probably when the church, we're now talking about the church, the founding of the church in Laodicea, around 55. That's just a little trivia for you as well, for all the history buffs out there. And, you know, Paul says, listen, Epaphras, the founder of this church, he is still passionate about you, and he prays for you passionately. He still has great zeal for the church. Verses 12 and 13 of Colossians 4. And he prays for them every day. You know, I imagine Paul and other faith-filled believers strategizing about where to go and where to evangelize, where do we start churches. As an executive presbyter for the SoCal network of the Assemblies of God, that's what we do. I mean, we sit around a table, a big table, there's about 20, 20 of us, 20 some, and we strategize about God building his church in Southern California. And we will say among one another, what cities do not have an Assemblies of God church? Well, I wonder if, if La Palma might plant a church in Anaheim. This was said many years ago. How long did the bridge live eight years. That's what I thought. And so we're talking and strategizing and they approach me and we had already been thinking about planting a church and Anaheim, as big as Anaheim is, 500,000 plus people, there's not a lot of AG influence there. And so we dreamed and we talked to Pastor Moses, who was our worship pastor. He said, I feel like God wants me to plant a church and be a lead pastor. And it all just came together wonderfully and beautifully. And we, we planted a church in Anaheim. And they made a great impact. And, and, and you know, they, they touched people and people were saved and people were healed and all kinds of wonderful things happened. I can just imagine Paul and Epaphras and I don't know who all, maybe Philemon's involved in this as well. And, you know, this Lycus Valley, that river just flows through this. There's Aeropolis, there's Colossae, there's, there's Laodicea. We've got to get there. We've got to let them know about Jesus. We've got to get some followers of Christ. We got to lead some people to the Lord and see what happens. And they're dreaming and they're praying. I just, my wheels just started turning when I read these final greetings, and, and, and Laodicea just popped out at me. So, Pastor Epaphras, he says, Well, I'll go. I'll go and I'll be, I'll found some churches over there. Let me go and evangelize and let me go and be a missionary wow so pastor Epaphras and a small band of believers they start a church in Laodicea of all places 
And they meet in Philemon's house. And they're on fire. I remember when we planted the bridge. We have some of the bridge family that's folding back in. And I love it. I love it. I remember how excited we were. And I remember that I, I stood at this very pulpit and I said, I think God is telling us as a church that we're not just planting Moses and Jamie and planting some money. We planted $30,000 as a church to God be the glory. And thank God that he has blessed us so much that we're able to do things like this. Amen. Amen. And many of you gave so we could do that. But I said, I think, church, God's wanting us to plant some of our people. And not just the troublemakers. <laughs> we planted some of the best people we had. We really did. We planted people like Jacob and Amanda Mize. The Udells. Dave and Robin Udell. I mean, we're talking about top shelf workers that are, were part of our church. We blessed it. We blessed them and sent them. Here's Epaphras saying, I'll go, but I need some help. Some people joining with him. Let's go. Let's go to Colossae. Let's go to Aeropolis. Let's go to Laodicea. And this church was on fire. It had to be on fire. People are getting saved. People are saying, yes, I'll come every week. They pray for the city. They evangelize the city. And the church begins to grow. I believe with all of my heart that Laodicea had great beginnings. Founding of the city, the founding of the church which leads to the founding of the culture. Because of its strategic location in the valley of Lycus and the Lycus River flowing through, Laodicea was a very successful city. A successful city of commerce and trade and extremely wealthy, apparently. And they were known for three main industries. Banking, Many would come to Laodicea for all of their banking needs. They were famous for banking. They were also famous for the manufacture of a certain kind of wool. I found this fascinating. The sheep which grazed around Laodicea, they were famous for their soft, violet black, glossy wool. And it was used to make clothing and carpet. And if you said that you had clothing from Laodicea, that was a big deal, and it cost you. Probably not cheap. If somebody said, oh, I love your carpet, and they said, oh, I got that from Laodicea two weeks ago. Oh, you got some money. It was a big deal. So they're known for the banking. They're known for the manufacture of this certain kind of wool and their clothing and carpet. But they were also known for medicine. The medical school in Laodicea had developed an eye salve that was sent all over the world during that time because it actually helped and brought healing to several eye issues. Fascinated me. I just kept on digging. So think of Laodicea like a modern financial center, maybe like New York City, maybe like London. Imagine a city so wealthy that after an earthquake destroyed the entire city in A.D. 60, Laodicea refused help from the Roman Empire, boasting that they could rebuild it on their own. That's a true story. This wealth gave the people of Laodicea a sense of self-sufficiency which seeped into the spiritual life of the church. They were influenced by the world. Sound familiar? So many churches are being influenced and making adjustments in their churches because of the world's influence.
Interestingly, Jesus says to them, look at Revelation 3.17. Do I have that? Yes. For you say, he's talking, he's rebuking the, 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 uh, the Laodiceans. You say, I am rich. You say, I have prospered. You say, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitif pitiful, poor. Remember, they're famous for their banking. Blind. They're famous for their eye salve. And what? They're famous for their clothing. Despite their wealth, they are poor. Despite their production of eye salve, they are blind. Despite their production of clothing, they are naked. How often do we feel self-sufficient? Maybe we don't live in a wealthy city, but we, we rely on our jobs, our bank accounts, and even our own intellect. God, help us. Don't think that we can't slip into a Laodicean mindset. It happens quickly and it happens too often. Laodicea reminds us that we cannot measure our spiritual health by our material success. Let's go now to the floundering. Yes, I made it. Start with the same letter and rhyme. Thank you. I can't help myself. I try to. This, despite its wealth, despite its affluence, Laodicea had a major problem. It's their water supply. Laodicea's water supply was poor and insufficient for the city, and so an aqueduct was constructed to pipe in water from hot springs that were miles away. And by the time it reached the city, the water was tepid, neither therapeutically hot nor refreshingly cold. It was lukewarm. How many coffee drinkers we have in the room? Come on, where are you at, coffee drinkers? Any hot tea drinkers? Oh. Chai, bless you. Chai. Hot coffee, hot tea. For me, if I'm going to drink hot coffee in the morning, I want my coffee to be hot. If you're going to drink hot tea, I ask my mother-in-law, she's drinking iced tea. I said, I thought you drank hot tea in the morning. She's like, oh, I already had that. She has that right away. Because that's what you want in the morning. Hot coffee where it burns your mouth. I can't let it cool down. It'll burn my lips, but I don't care. I'm ready for that first little sip of hot coffee. <laughs> hot tea, whatever you, whatever you like. Sometimes I get busy and I get sidetracked and my coffee goes cold before I finished it. And then I grab my cup and I take a sip and I'm like, yeah, let me zap that in the microwave or something or start a new, a fresh cup. I don't like lukewarm. I like iced coffee. If I'm going to have iced coffee, I like that. But don't give me something in between. <laughs> I'm preaching right now. I, I mean... You think just because I'm talking about coffee, I, I stop preaching. I'm preaching. See, that's the picture Jesus gives us here. A church that has lost its fervor. A church that has lost its passion. A church that has lost its usefulness. Lukewarm. A lukewarm Christian isn't on fire for God. But they aren't really turned away either. And they can really talk the talk. Maybe fool some people. Oh, I go to La Palma Christian Center. Wow. They sit in the middle, complacent, comfortable, ineffective. The spiritual condition of Laodicea is the same as many Christians today, just going through the motions without any real zeal for God. 
That's why La Palma Christian Center, we got to stay full. We got to stay on fire. We got to stay ablaze for, for God. Don't let the embers cool. Don't let the fire go out. We have to rekindle. How do we rekindle the fire? We get into the Word of God and let the Word of God get into us. How do we rekindle the fire? We pray to the Almighty God every day, multiple times throughout the day. How do we rekindle the fire? We praise Him and we worship Him and we adore Him and we meditate on Him. How do we rekindle the fire? We find ourselves in the seats on Sunday. Don't neglect this. This is a critical part of rekindling your flame and rekindling your fire and staying full. Oh, I'll just watch you online. Listen, I understand that there are some people that are watching, and I thank God for you, and I thank God that we have the technology for you to see me and for you to hear me. Some of the family that is watching, they can't get here. But there might be one or two, hello, I see you. You should be here, and you could be here, but you're not here. So get yourself here. Is that okay to say? Honestly, because it's more than just hearing me preach. I need you to help me serve. I need you to help me build this church and build this kingdom and impact our city. I need you here. Come on, church, and say amen and say, come on. Tell them, come on. Come on. If you can't get here, I understand. And thank God. We got Dan and Dodie. Dodie's going to have a birthday. I don't know if she's viewing. I hope she is because happy birthday, Dodie. 89. I know. I shouldn't start mentioning names because I'll leave people out. Lee, I know Lee, she's going to text me. She'll probably text me before I'm finished with the sermon. Lee Kavakovich, she just can't get here every week, but she loves us. Joan Sellers and Janie Garcia and uh, who am I missing? Who am I missing? Who? Bill and Louise, they're in the hospital right now. But we love them dearly. We pray for them, but they can't get here. And there's more. Sorry if I've left you out. We love you. We thank God that you're able to connect with us this way. My point is, we need to make sure that the fire that God has ignited in us, in our hearts, in our lives, and in our minds, it stays fueled. And these are some of the ways that that can happen. Ask yourself, church, are you on fire for Christ, or have you settled into a lukewarm state? Are you still passionate about your faith or do you simply go through the motions comfortable but ineffective? Let me close this message today with the final words to Laodicea. Jesus spoke some final words to the church in Laodicea, starting with a rebuke. Let's look at the rebuke. We'll have to go to Revelation chapter 3 for this. Starting with verse 14, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write these words. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Wow. I know your works. Listen, La Palma Christian Center. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me 
gold refined by fire. Remember, it's noted for banking. Jesus, he nailed this thing. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may truly be rich. And instead of the violet black garments, buy white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness. So that your nakedness will not be seen. And I counsel you to put salve and anoint your eyes with salve so that you may truly see. See, you didn't know all that when you read about Laodicea before, did you? The banking, the clothing manufacturer, the medicinal eye salve that actually worked and so it went around the world and Jesus leans into that, getting their attention. Don't miss that irony. Jesus uses the things that that city and the people were best known for and the things they prided themselves. He told them, I know. I know your works. You are lukewarm and you make me sick. His rebuke is not out of anger. His rebuke is out of love, really. Much like a parent who sees their child heading in the wrong direction. They don't give up on the child, but they lovingly correct that child, hoping to bring that child back to the right path. Thank God that he didn't just offer a rebuke and, and give a stern rebuke. He also offers a remedy. The remedy. Look at the remedy. Revelation 3, 19, those whom I love, I rebuke, I reprove, I discipline. Here's the remedy. So be zealous, on fire, passionate. Be zealous and repent. Verse 20, we know this one well. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will eat with him and he will eat with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says to the church. The remedy is four simple steps. Before you put your notes away, write these down. Step one, be zealous. Let your passion be revived today. And may we all go back to our first love. Do you remember when the, you first gave your heart to Christ? Do you remember when you found your way to an altar and you asked Jesus to forgive you just like some did here today? Do you remember the smile that came on your face? Do you remember the feeling in your heart? God, let us return to our first love of you. Be zealous. Repent. We all could be encouraged with this today. Repent. To repent is to turn away from your sin. Not just ask for forgiveness of your sin. We need to ask God to forgive us of our sin but we also then need to repent and turn away from it and stop doing it. That's what Jesus told the sinful woman. Stop sinning. Your sins are forgiven. No one has condemned you, neither do I condemn you. Now go, but stop sinning. <laughs> go and sin no more. We say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. And he says, okay. And then we go, and the next day, or the day after that, or three days later, whatever it is, we do the same thing. And then we say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. Okay. When are we going to stop sinning and repent and turn from it? I thank God for his endless supply of forgiveness. But Paul said, should we keep on sinning so he can just keep on forgiving us? And we can just say his grace is so good. And 
Paul said, God forbid. May we grow up. Maybe it's time to grow up. Stop doing the things that stunt our growth. Be zealous, repent, open your heart's doors, he said. I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking on your heart. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Can you hear it? Will you let him in? Can you hear him knocking? Come on, church. Thankfully, several responded to his knocking today. Come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. Let me... Let me forgive you. Let me fill your heart. Let me fill your life. Do you hear him knocking? He's standing there knocking. Why won't you let me in? Wow. We've got to open our hearts, doors. Finally, let the Holy Spirit lead your life. He who has ears, let him hear. Let the Spirit lead. He sent the Spirit as a guide for us. He, spent, he sent the Spirit as our helper. Anybody need help? Anybody be honest with me today and say, Pastor, i, I got to be honest, I need help. <laughs> I, I do too. I do too, man. I'm just telling you, I need help. We all need help. And so he says, well, I've, t I've taken care of that. I've sent the helper, the one who will guide you and lead you. We just have to listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying, and he never shouts. I get fired up and I start shouting at you. Sorry. But he's always just whispering and gently prompting. We have to hear that. We have to respond to that. Lessons from Laodicea. Jesus stands at the door of our hearts today. Maybe we've been distant. Perhaps we've become lukewarm. Maybe we're self-sufficient. But he's knocking, offering intimacy and renewal. And all we need to do is open the door and invite him in. I wonder, are we willing to repent of our sins are we willing to repent of our lukewarm living? Are we willing to invite Jesus to renew our hearts and rekindle the fire that once burned so brightly? The Palma Christian Center, hear me as I close. We don't want to become a Laodicean church, do we? And it can happen. But God, help us today. Help us today, Lord. Can I invite you to stand with me? And maybe just posture yourself as I am. God, we come and we, we acknowledge that so often... We're not all that you desire us to be and all that you have created us to be. Sometimes we're relying on our own abilities. We, at times, become self-sufficient. But Lord, we hear you calling us today. We hear the firm encouragement the stern warning even. And we hear you and we, we respond. We do not resist this. We ask you, Lord, to breathe on the embers in our hearts and in our minds and our lives and set ablaze a fire. Rekindle a passion in us, Lord, individually and collectively that we would be a people on fire. That we would be a church that is on fire, burning with passion for Christ, burning with passion for God and for the Spirit, 
burning with passion for the lost. Let that fire burn brightly and never die. And may we never become lukewarm. Well, it's good to be in his house today and hear his word and receive this word and receive these lessons from Laodicea. Jacob's coming. He's going to dismiss us in prayer. But may the Lord bless you, church. I'm so glad that you've been in his house today.